ahead and just get into this particular offering now. Um, it, 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 I may have to just consolidate it some because it's not too lengthy. I have eight articles. Um, nonetheless, some of them may have more content than others. But I want to focus on the reflection that God has allowed me to provide for this week. But I want to give this offering a theme. And this theme I want to call Matters of the Mind. And this is in light of the part shot. Okay? This is in light of the part shot. Okay. And we're going to focus on the serpent again. I want to bring back this, this matter that relates to the serpent. And it's interesting how nature, how Yah has created and designed nature. Because if someone, type in the room what you perceive to be the antidote for a venomous snake bite. What is the antidote? What is the antidote of a venomous snake bite? Can someone please type in the text box what is the antidote? Antivenom, which is nothing more exactly than venom. Okay, so I find that very interesting. And that the remedy for being bitten by a serpent who is venomous is similar venom taken from serpents who have similar enzymes. So this is a very unique matter of chemistry. <laughs> Notice what I'm saying. This is a very unique matter as relates to chemistry, okay? This is dealing with fluids, and we're going to deal with some fluids. We're going to deal with a lot of physiology, but we're also going to deal with some college, some psychology. I have to go get my articles. I'm on my tablet. My, my laptop is completely uh, dysfunctional right now, so I may be going in and out of the room, so I, I want to just uh, beg for you all to be patient with me as I'm, I'm copying and pasting these sources and getting them to you. So let me go grab this first article, um, and then I'll be right back. Okay, so if it does stay, I hope it does stay. If it does not stay, I'm actually going to uh, come right back into the room. Here I go. Let's see what this does. I don't know if you all can still hear me, but I will talk in the process of it. And again, matters of the mind. We're going to deal with some very, very profound matters that in my attempt to demystify these scriptures so that we can have a clearer understanding of what these scriptures are actually saying in code okay one thing we have to understand is that this book is a cold book Yah has not revealed his mysteries to everybody but to his chosen to his servants to the elect that is whom Yah has chosen to reveal these matters too. And so, I'm getting this back together. I hope this doesn't take place the whole time. Alright, give me one second. <laughs> This is just amazing. I can see I'm going to have to be very patient. And they're going to have to be very patient with me as well. Because uh, on my tablet and my laptop is not functioning properly. Alright, if I can be heard again, give me a four. And, and you know, <laughs> this is going to be very interesting. And I hope this first article really captures what the essence of this matter is going to be about. The name of the article from Business Insider is called How Donald Trump Won by Engaging the Reptilian Brain. <laughs> so when you access this article, 
please give me a four. This was written on November 10th of 2016, last year. How Donald Trump won by engaging the reptilian brain. And you can somewhat see where this is going to go just from the this preliminary article, all right? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to focus definitely on what this is about. So, for years, surveys have been and still are the favorite tools of pollsters and marketers. Media are flooded with survey results from completely ridiculous to completely useless. Year after year, business students, humanities students are made to construct a survey, upload it on sites like SurveyMonkey, and practice their predictive skills using logistic regression or factor analysis. Once a student of mine was testing the potential link between gender and the intention to buy luxury goods, females responded were coded one, and male respondents were coded two. Her final analysis read as follows. As sex increases from one to two, intention to buy luxury good increase by X percent. It took me a while to convince her that she needed to rephrase her analysis because conclusions aren't often a unidimensional, aren't often as unidimensional as they are made out to be. Gender has also played its role in the Hillary versus Trump election. Innumerable polls predicted a victory for Hillary Clinton. Very much so, more M70. Authoritarianism is very much so a predictive uh, behavior as well. And we'll get to that. We all know what happened in 1985 when Coca Cola tested the new Coke formula on 200,000 subjects and came up with the drink that beat Pepsi and Old Coke time and time again. Therefore, when it finally went to the market, the company felt confident enough in their research numbers to simultaneously end Old Coke production. Coke eventually lost millions of dollars. It is too early to say what America or the world will lose with Donald Trump at its helm. But with Trump being a climate change denier, there may indeed be much to fear. The truth is that surveys are completely useless. Surveys are useless simply because humans are only humans in front of other humans. This is called the theory of social desirability. Okay, keep that in mind. The theory of social desirability. Okay. This theory suggests that interviewees will tend to avoid socially unacceptable responses or will tend to provide answers which he or she proposes or perceives to be matching the value system of the interviewer. In the solitude of the voting booth or alone in front of their computers, humans are liberated from, their, from all the social norms that regulate their everyday life. No more Mr. or Mrs. Good guys or girls. On Google Analytics, pornography and violence top the charts. The, now listen to this right here. The socially aware neocortex, and we're going to get to this, goes on sleep mode while the reptilian brain takes over. And we're going to really focus on this, okay? What I want you all to do real quick is if you can just preliminarily see where this is going. Keep in mind, we're dealing with Nahash. We're dealing with the serpent, okay? But we're going to introduce a new element, and a, I would even call it a new serpent, okay? It has not yet been seen in Scripture up until this point, okay? So if you're following me, what I'm saying, and you're seeing where this neocortex is now introduced, but also this reptilian brain is introduced, please give me a one in confirmation of you being able to see just maybe in, in a glimpse of where this will go. Okay, very important. So, the reptilian brain. This is the part of the animal, or the animal part of us, humans. Its mission is simple. Live and reproduce. Okay, this is the animal part of humans. Okay, that reptilian brain, which is, we'll get to all that in a very short while. For it, for this it equips us with fight or flight reactions, hunger and thirst, and sexual pleasure. That is what the reptilian brain does. It keeps you breathing, it keeps your heart pulsating, and it gives you these basic instinctual drives, okay? A study by Young and Rubicam measured people's conscious and unconscious values, and in particular, American citizens' values. The study found that while conscious values of helpfulness, self-actualization, and the meaning of life ranked highest, unconscious values were all about security or fear, sex and tradition linked to security and indeed fear, in other words, the reptilian brain. This is the simple secret behind the Trump victory and the failure of polls. While Hillary appealed to the rational human in us with discourse about compassion and helpfulness, Trump's racist, sexist, violent speeches 
resonating well with Americans' unconscious views, fear, and sex. Sadly, there is much to worry when the reptilian brain is placed at the will of the most powerful nation of the world. But I would argue that this has always been the case since the beast system has appeared. The reptilian brain, which we will analyze, has been at the forefront of the imperial systems. And this is why the world is the way it is. This is why capitalism dominates. This is why classism, this is why racism, this is why all these pathological diseases comes into existence. These demonic activities come into existence because man is functioning at the basic level of consciousness, which is at the reptilian level, the level of a beast, okay? Now, we're going to expand this much, much more, very much so, yo, El. Uh, Leviathan is exactly what this is about. And David Ick is on it, but he kind of takes it into the spooky realm and talks about these aliens, okay? Well, I will say that they're aliens, but they're alien to humanity, okay? And I mean that in the sense that they're, they're strangers because of their behavior and their mode of thinking. They're alien in that sense. They're not indigenous to the human consciousness. They are indigenous to the beastly consciousness, okay? Second article. Let me go grab it. I'll be right back. Bavaka Shah, give me one moment. Because we got to get this right. I want to make sure that whatever's presented to you all is indeed going to stimulate your neocortex region. We got to get this thing understood. <clears throat> because this is a very, very important um, concept that we're going to be dealing with is not merely a concept, it is much more than a concept. And we want to make sure that we have a, a grasp of understanding this matter. All right. Get this second article up and going. Is that the article there? Yep, that's it. All right, let me get back to Pal Talk. Hope everyone's doing just fine in the world of Spreaker. All right, if I can be heard again, give me a four. Uh, I do truly apologize for this in and out. But uh, this is the article, More M70. If you could just repost that for me, Bavaka Shah, that'd be greatly appreciated. This article comes to us from the Body Language University. It is called The Reptilian Brain, a prehistoric hold over hiding out in the human head. Now, one thing I want to really make clear is, is Hebrew vision prides itself on seeing things in the spirit, but we also desire to make this more simple in understanding, as complex as it may be at times, but that is in order to simplify it. There are correspondences that Yah has given us that we can actually perceive the true form of by understanding the, the, the replica, okay? Um, and I mean that in the sense that, like, Moshe was shown a vision of the tabernacle, right? The pattern of it. But Moshe had to go and replicate that pattern, that pattern that he was shown. But that replica pointed to the actual vision, and to the reality, okay? Yah does the same thing to us. And this is what Yahushua was informing Nakdemon or Nicodemus when he told him, how can you understand heavenly matters if you don't understand the matters of earth? So when we start to really perceive the matters of earth, that we can really start to understand and conceive and perceive the matters of heaven, okay? And what I'm saying is, in essence, what we're wanting to do is demystify much of this because the scriptures are written in layers, okay? If you understand what I'm saying by layers, please give me a three, okay? That the scriptures are written in layers, okay? And we talked about a short while ago 
as far as one of the exegetical methods of scripture is called pardest, okay? The Pashat method, surface, you have the Hermes, which is the hint. You have the Drash method, which is um, the comparative, and you're dealing with the allegorical. And then the fourth is the Sud method, which is the mystery, the revealed level, okay, of consciousness. And so this is all ultimately about consciousness. This is a cold book. It's not a literal book to read literally at times. There's points where there are literals, but we have to understand that there's always a deeper moral involved, okay? And so what we're wanting to do now is demystify this matter. And we're going to focus on the serpent, but now we're coming to a part where we start to understand and see the serpent at work in human life. And this is in the reptilian brain, and we will get to that much later. This is by Tanya Riemann. She says, the reptilian brain. This is the story of a man, a simple man, really, average in every way, typical in looks, intelligence, and charm. I invite you to travel along with us to discover how the oldest and most universal part of his brain affects his day, his views, his dealings with those around him, and his status in the world. Join me, won't you? Meet Jack and his reptilian brain. Jack, a human of the reptilian persuasion. More than a handful of evolutionists will attest to the fact that humans are descended of reptiles. Now, I'm not necessarily subscribing to that, you know, in the sense that, you know, man and everything is created according to its own seed, okay? So the quirkiest of those even believe that a few lizard human hybrids still walk among us. Now, no matter your personal opinions about the theory of evolution, there's no doubting that a portion of your brain is similar, if not nearly identical, to the structure and function of a reptile's brain. Okay, seed of the serpent. This is what this is talking about. Let's understand how this takes place. Is it a literal serpent? We will get to that as well. According to Paul D. McLean, the physician and neurosurgeon, not the rugby player, the human brain is constructed of three major areas. And this is important. We're going to go over this several times. The upper and outer part of the human brain can be referred to as the neocortex or the new brain. It's responsible for cognitive thought and movement. Blanketed by the neocortex is the limbic section of the brain. You can thank this portion for emotions like guilt, affection, and hatred. And at the center of it all, housed within the base of your skull, is what McLean labeled the reptilian complex or the R-complex. It is the reptilian brain. It is our oldest and most instinctive machine. It's responsible for most of Jack's story. The reptilian brain test. Before Jack takes us for a long ride, he would like to stop for a snack, his favorite snack. In fact, peanut M&Ms. Never had them? Well, you simply must try one. And Okay, so anyway, the hard outer shell of the M&M is much like your brain's neocortex. Its manufacture is complicated, just as human evolution manufacture of the neocortex took millions of years. So this is the latest development in our central nervous system, okay? The neocortex is the latest development, all right? Its color varies, just as the neocortex cognitive and motor skills vary, or levels vary among humans. Depending on education and heredity, it's tough. Won't melt in your hand, though. And don't forget its placement in the manufacturing of the candy. It comes last, blanketing the rest of the tree, just as the evolution most recently blanketed the human brain with the neocortex. Next is the chocolate. Comparable to the limbic system, the chocolate is emotional, okay? It requires some processing, but its ingredients are older and more primitive than those of the outer shell, it's reminding us of our own antique limbic brain systems. Its color and flavor is consistent from piece to piece, just as our limbic systems vary little from person to person. In the manufacturing process, it is applied before the outer shell, the neocortex, just as the limbic system evolved before the cognitive portion of the human brain. And finally, the peanut. This is the reptilian brain, the most simple, organic, and naturally unscrewed with by evolution portion. Like the peanut, your reptilian brain is embedded in the center of your noggin. It is largely consistent from person to, to person to person, and it has remained unchanged for millions of years. This is this old mind, okay? Listen to what I'm saying. This is an old mind found in an old serpent-like structure. Keep that in your pocket. We'll get to that as well. So other creatures share this peanut, but it does not give us the basis from which humanity sprang, just as the peanut gives the chocolate and candy shell a medium, a center, on which to build, okay? Jack's morning view. Jack stumbles from bed, makes his coffee, forages for the remote, and flips on the TV. 
He does this every morning. Jack feels unable to shower, eat, or feed the dog until he's had a dose of Java with a side of Whoopi. Today on The View, President Obama is visiting with, his, with the girls. He refers to our reptilian brains as causing humans to be cautious when they encounter people that look or sound different from themselves. He cites this part of the brain as being accountable for racism and that it must be fought against. Jack ponders the president's point, largely agrees, know that he will forget about it by noon, and breathes deeply as the camera pans to Elizabeth, who makes Jack smile, okay? So, there's a commercial on, a half-clothed man with plenty plentiful muscles, a resonant voice, and skin as smooth as a caramel latte travels the world while openly declaring that he must be, smells better than most men. Suddenly, Jack, the man, who never uses anything stronger than an and the person decides he's had enough coffee and goes directly to his planner and adds Old Spice to his to-do list, okay? So, you can just see what's going on. I'm not going to read the rest of this article, but this is something about the reptilian brain, okay? We're seeing this as the most basic, instinctual, and I would even call it, well, we'll get to that. Well, I'm not even going to just bring it all out right now. I'll get to that. This one. Oh man, don't tell me that, that what happened. All right, give me one moment. I got to actually. Dang, I can't believe this. I don't want that one. Something tells me this is not good. Okay, so we got to, well, you know what, we're going to bypass a lot of this. Let's do this. Let's just get to this. Well, okay, we're good with that then. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and amend a lot of this. I'm only going to do a few more articles. I think you all will get the point as we read some of these other articles. I was going to get really scientific with it and get into understanding in depth the neocortex. I'll, I'll, I'll send the links at another time, um, or I'll give them to M70 and he can add it to the uh, actual the email blast. But I'm going to go ahead and and and, and, and like cut this some. Um, and, and just bring the focus articles on it, okay? So good, you get the gist, that's what's up. So let me go ahead and get this next article, and then we'll get it moving. Get this next article, this is going to be from Collective Evolution. And it's going to be an article about this reptilian brain again, and how we can actually defeat this reptilian brain, because this is a very important part of what we need to do to overcome this matter. Just give me one second. It's a little simpler, hopefully. getting all these articles up so I don't have to really back and forth and back and forth. Alright, hopefully it gets all of them here. Great. Boom. Alrighty. This is what I'm going to do now. Give me just a moment. Just pulling up <clears throat> on the laptop or the excuse me, the, the tablet now. Having just a few moments of technical difficulty. I will be getting back to this room shortly. All right, had to shut the 
everything down. Coming back to it though. Don't know what happened there. It's one of those days, just dealing with some stuff. Right, thank you for your patience. This is the next article here. More AM70. That's not the next article. Dag nabbit. Hold on. Funky Cole Medina. This is a lot, a whole lot, just back and forth. I got to make sure I get this figured out by next week. I don't want to go through this repeatedly at all. Fingers knocking me out, bringing it back. Very frustrating. Alright, here we have the next article. Mario 7, if you could just recopy and paste that Bavaka shot, that'd be great, because uh, if not, you'll have to copy and paste it and get to it yourself. This is from Collective Evolution website, told out Robin Moray. The name of the article is entitled, How to Bypass Your Reptilian Brain and Restore Your Creative Power. This is written by Isabel B. on June 16th in 2013. All right, when you access this article, Bavakasha, give me a four, and we can go ahead and proceed with this particular article. This is a very interesting article. Following my last article, she says, the law of attraction and the power of your mind, the subsequent information intends to further expand to the application of the necessary skill of discernment in order to manifest your desired reality. And I will say reality, okay? What we're dealing with a lot is illusion because the mind has deceived us into perceiving a false reality, okay? And we'll get to all that soon. This is exactly what happened to Adam and Hawa in the garden. And we'll talk about that as we get to the last article. So to recap, your mind is a sophisticated broadcasting system. We admit and absorb frequencies according to the frequencies or the thoughts and belief systems, those are vibrations, that we hold in our mind. In order to reset our innate power of creation, we must get our mind right. This is what uh, Moray Nuriyahu said about, you know, the prodigal son. He came to himself. Well, what does that mean? That means he had to get his mind right. He had to come to himself and awaken, okay? So again, we must get our mind right by consciously applying discernment to every frequency, thought, or emotion. This is what 2 Corinthians 10 really talks about, that we emit and absorb. In other words, choosing to accept or reject frequencies is the first step in resetting your broadcast system, your mind. Choose life or death. This is what the scripture clearly tells us, okay? It is how we begin to attune ourselves to source energy, our higher self, our life's purpose, happiness, love, our true potential, etc. Since the average individual's mind broadcasts in the bar park about 70,000 thoughts per day, okay? So you entertain some way, somehow, some shape, some form, some fashion, about 70,000 thoughts per day, okay? We would drive ourselves absolutely mad trying to discern or monitor every one of those thoughts, especially since the vast majority of those are ingrained in the subconscious through belief systems that have deeply conditioned our habitual neuron pathways. All this is dealing with the mind, matters of the mind. The good news is that there is a shortcut to monitoring your thoughts and re-attuning yourself to your true manifestation potential. The shortcut is your emotions, your innate guided system. This is a basic process. This is now going from the reptilian brain to the limbic brain. So it's an elevation of consciousness. That's all that is, okay? This is a basic process that is fundamental to manifestation. Focus on feeling good. Remember, uh, as a man thinks, so he is. 
As a man thinketh, so he is. This is what this is talking about, okay? These are all scriptural dynamics that we're just bringing out in a more simplistic way, okay? We're decoding it, and we're giving context to it. When your emotions are signaling that something doesn't feel good, apply discernment and refocus your vibration on anything that feels good, a higher frequency. This is what Philippians 4 talks about. I think on these types of things, that which is good, that which is true, that which is lovely, you know what I'm saying? You know, I can do all things through the Messiah. This is a mentality that it's talking about. This is an affirmation that the mind is 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 exercising in order to elevate it. And we'll talk about this. So listen to the whispers. And this is what Nahash is about. This is what Nahash does. It whispers. That's what the word serpent means at its root. Nahash means the whisperer. Okay. But listen to the whispers, the frequencies life is offering to you, as Oprah would say. Okay, now it's time to elaborate on the implementation of discernment. Here it is. Okay, so detachment is the state of being objective because discernment requires detachment. Okay, so detachment is the state of being objective. That means you're not putting any emotion into it. You're observing, okay? You're a witness to things. And you have to be objective and remove your emotion in order to discern or filter, if that makes more sense to you, a situation, <clears throat> excuse me, where is that at? A situation or frequency that you have manifested into your current reality, you must be able to detach yourself from it compulsively, the reptilian brain responses reacting to it, okay? So you cannot compulsively respond or react to it. Impulsive is to react without forethought. This is talking about the neocortex now. Now you're talking about the neocortex's operation. This would be a great challenge at first. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I found that this can stir up all kinds of change in your life because until recently in our history, we had been conditioned to operate and function mainly out of the reptilian brain. This is where most of humanity operates. And when you're operating on the reptilian level, well, you are nothing more than a beast. And if you understand what I'm saying, please give me a seven because this is crucial. I'm guaranteeing you. The more we see this and we connect this to scripture, this is imperative information, okay? Crucial and vital information to understand in order to really even get a barometer on where you are, okay? To self-assess. Was this from the reptilian brain, the limbic brain? Or was it from the neocortex? And you can tell that by the characteristics that we're going to associate with each of these levels, okay? Continuing on. We had been operating and manifesting out of the survival mode of section of the brain. Once you can understand this concerted mental oppression, you can begin to retrain your mind and free yourself from the constant, constant reptilian brain-generated reaction and resets your innate human gift of creative power. This is what we were made in the image and likeness of Yah. We are little Elohim, okay? That's what we are to be. It says that the house of uh, the feeble shall be like the house of David, and the house of David shall be like Elohim, okay? And it says that also in Psalm 82, okay? These are realities that we have to reactivate, and we have to represent to the world, both represent and represent to the world, okay? So this will be easier to apply if you can give yourself a minute to comprehend and really soak in the following aspects about the brain function, okay? So humans have three interdependent yet interconnected sections of the brain. We talked about the first is the reptilian section, the limbic section, and the neocortex section. Each has its purpose. The reptilian section is the instant, no discernment, survival mode, response section of the brain, the oldest in terms of our reptil reptil human evolution, excuse me, it is the old brain, the reptilian brain. The limbic system is the section of the brain that first emerged in mammals. It generates our feelings and emotions in regard to our current reality. In the neomammalian section, the new human, okay, section of the brain, the evolved section of higher order thinking. Side note, I wonder if Keanu Reeves' matrix uh, character in the name Neo in the Matrix was derived from the understanding of the neocortex section of the human mind. So, Maurice Shemaniah just referred to Neo as far as him knowing that he was the one. He just knew. And this is what the neocortex does. It, it operates beyond the reptilian brain and the limbic brain. And that movie really is an evolution of Neo um, 
Mr. Anderson uh, going from his reptilian brain to his neocortex. That's what this is about. Ultimately, and we'll get to that. It has infinite abilities. The neocortex has infinite abilities. It is the evolved conscious section of our brain, which is most in line with source, with our higher self, our true unlimited potential. It generates creation, manifestation, imagination, awareness, development, logical thinking, objectivity, empathy, and most importantly, consciousness. It is the new brain, okay? Each section has its necessary purpose. For now, anyway, this person foresees the reptilian section going in standby mode once we attune ourselves to our manifestation power, the neocortex section of the brain. In my intuitive, intuitive opinion, I think that every human today has the potential to eventually evolve through conscious effort, which will eventually become automatic into a higher functioning brain capacity based in infinite love and respect, which will see the evolutionary decline of the reptilian section of the mind. That's that old, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> we will get to that. But again, this takes conscious effort. This is not something that we just awaken to like, poof, I've made it. I've been transformed in the blink of an eye with no effort. It doesn't happen like that, okay? We have to put effort forward into it. Going back to the garden, where it says, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread all the days of your life, okay? So this is what we have to understand. So I'm going to leave that article there. You get the gist of it now. This is very, very crucial stuff. And I want to now pull up my second to last article and then get to the main feature. And I'm not going to read all of this either. As a matter of fact, you know what? Let's just get to it. Let's just get to the meat and potatoes. I'll just get right to it. Because it says pretty much, you know, the way I write, it, 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 it draws from other areas to confirm the points that I'm making. And so... Um, that's what this is doing here. It's just drawing from some of the research that I um, did for this particular, this article. And so what I'm doing now is just accessing my last article for you and just keep this simple. Hopefully you all will see what it is as relates to the matters of the mind that y'all has shown me. <coughs> up and I'm going to paste it hmm. want to thank you all for being so patient with us today to shut down again Coming right back though, and finishing this up here. This will be my last offering. Keep this nice and short. I don't want to get too laborious because we've been going for some time already. So, to just make this nice and simple, we're just going to like, truncate this offering a little bit. When you access this last article of mine, Please give me a four. This is the Hebrew Vision News exclusive. It is entitled The Fiery Serpent in the Wilderness. Parshat Huchat Reflections. Now, keep in mind, just in brief, we've, we've covered our brains. And we're going to see what the brains really is about with this particular offering here. And how it relates to this week's Parsha. But how the scriptures give us the formula for elevating from the reptilian brain to the neocortex because that is where the kingdom must first take place we can talk all day about building this physical when I mean physical as far as even coming together as a body individual but if we are not perfecting ourselves and we are not coming into the anointing ourselves and this is what I was talking about when more AM70 was which was brought, were presenting his offering, it said, I said that we have to be in Mashiach in order to, um, you know, uh, 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 pretty much overcome. But even more significantly is that Yahushua 
Mashiach has to be in us. And that is the 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 quintessential imperative right there. If Mashiach is not in us, okay, if if the anointing is not flowing and cascading and overflowing from within us, no matter what we do is not going to come to pass. Yes, and that, that is the reality. And I pray this article gives us the understanding of what the fiery serpent, not just the serpent, okay? There's serpents in the scripture, but this fiery serpent in the wilderness is what we must pay attention to. And when we look at this image that is being uh, posted here, this is this is an image that an artist, uh, not an image, uh, a, a sculpture that an artist did. I forgot the artist's name. But what do you see when you look at this sculpture that this artist made? What is it that you see overlooking? This is Mount Hor even, I believe. What do you see in this image that opens this article? With the, I mean, this is like just an ideal shot. This is a perfect shot that is made. Please type in on the stake. So are you saying the crucifixion? Do you see the crucifixion here? Is that what you see more than M70? Masetta. Okay. And this is what we have to see. And uh, uh, more than M70 said, yes, this is Yahushua. But now let's take this a step further. Now let's proceed to go deeper. Okay. Because we see the form of it. We're going to get out of cliches. We're going to get out of, to, out of these, these, these parables. And we want to get into the revelation of this. We want to get into the, again, the demystification of the scripture. Let's make this as simple and plain as possible. And we're going to do it empirically because everything that the scriptures speak of, it, 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 it relates to us physiologically. Everything that takes place in the scriptures is also speaking about what is taking place within us. If you understand what I'm saying there, please give me a four. If you understand that what I'm saying and that what the scriptures are describing in processes is also a description of processes that take place within us, in code. And this is the highest level of consciousness that there is for scripture. This is what we must come to understand. Because this allows the activation of the anointing to come into reality. Let's go ahead with this article. We're going to open up with a quote from the Zohar. The Zohar is, is attributed, interestingly, to um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He was a, a, a sage of, I do believe, the first, if not the first, the second century. Okay, and this is one of the earliest books on Israelite mysticism that existed. Okay, and yes, it does deal with some mysticism, but the mystics were not, they were, they were pretty much like the scientists, if I may. They were the Israelite scientists. Okay, they were the spirit scientists. If you understand what I'm saying with that, please give me a one. That the, the, the Kabbalists, the, the mystics, they dealt with the sacred sciences of scripture. And there is a sacred science that exists. The priesthood pretty much for the most part, although there were others who were also privy to it, but the priesthood were the custodians and the janitors and the protectors of the spirit science. If I can be heard, if can I be heard clearly with this? I, I, my uh, Doda says it's okay, hallelujah. So this quote says, we were taught that whoever guards his lips and tonguing. We've seen up to this point that it has been the lips and the tongues of the people, these grumblers, even coming out of, of Mitzrayim, has led Israel into these woeful experiences. It has always been their lips and their tongue, okay? But we were taught that whoever guards his lips and tongue is worthy of clothing himself with the Holy Spirit. And anybody who curves his lips to speak evil will be harmed by that matter of which he speaks. Meaning that if he speaks the evil tongue, 
like the primordial snake, that old serpent, hmm, we'll come to that, then that snake dominates him, it overcomes him, it seizes him, okay, it consumes him, and that is why when Israel spoke against Elohim and Moses, he set snakes and vipers upon him, if he does not, he is afflicted by diseases of leprosy, or diseases or leprosy, which is burning like a snake, as we have already explained. That's from the Parshat Huchat section of the uh, Zohar, this week's uh, uh, Parshat. Second quote, And Yah said to Moshe, Make for yourself a fiery serpent, and place it on a pole, and it will be that anyone who, has, who was bitten will look at it and live. Moshe made a serpent of copper and placed it on the pole. So it was that if the serpent bit a man, he would stare at the copper serpent and live. Numbers 21, 6 through 7. And I, I have to read this quote to open this article up. Uh, this was the perfect quote to really, I would even say summarize everything that's in this particular, uh, this reflection. Consciousness. Heed these words. You who wish to probe the depths of nature, if you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you're not looking within first and foremost, you're not going to see anything from without. Okay? Or without. You're not going to see anything without if you're not looking within first. Okay? If you ignore the wonders of your own house, Moray Shabbanai was just saying, get your house in order. Take care of your own house. But if you do not see or you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. And we're going to talk about that. Know thyself and you will know the universe. And I'm just going to say in the most high. Humanity is endowed with three natures, two of which are manifest from birth and one remains latent until its discovery. The two which are manifest are that of our human and animal natures. The divine nature, that which remains latent, requires activation for its far-reaching, resonating effects to stimulate our cognitive processes, which then awakens our consciousness unto previously unknown levels. Of this latency, Dr. George Perry and Inez Carey speak of in the monumental work, God, man, the word made flesh on page 157 saying, quote, in every brain, in every single brain, there are countless dormant cells. How much brain do, uh, capacity do we use? Can someone type in how much brain capacity on average do humans use on a daily basis? Can someone type in what the rough percentage is? How much percent of our brain do we use on a daily basis on average? If you take a test <laughs> and you only pass 10% of the test, did you pass the test or did you fail miserably? Do you see what I'm saying? Now, given the examinations that we've done so far with these articles, where would you say this 10% of the brain functions in? Where or what part of the brain would you say Given the 10% that we use regularly, where does it function? In the neocortex, in the limbic, or in the reptilian brain? Where would you say that 10% functions? Huh, boom. So most of humanity is functioning on the reptilian levels. And the rest of their brain, now it wouldn't be limbic, auntie. That would be the reptilian brain. <laughs> They're operating with the brain of the reptile or can we call it the serpent and you'll see that very shortly but there's 90 percent of our brain that's dormant okay in every brain there are countless dormant brain cells waiting for the coming of the air age the bridegroom or the recognition of the messiah in the flesh this is talking about you and us together individually and as a body a collective so this is what will quicken them into activity, i.e. it will resurrect them. The resurrection takes place, boom, and we'll see where soon in the mind. Everywhere, there is evidence of the awakening of dormant brain cells.
spiritual phenomena, multiple personality, mental telepathy, and kindred manifestations are explainable upon the hypothesis that dormant brain cells may be made to bloom and thus operate according to new concepts, a new way of thinking, being born again to be a new creature, to put your mind and your thoughts in Shamayim or heaven. Continuing. We know that there are millions of dormant brain cells in the cerebrum, especially in the most high portion, the seat of spiritual faculties. This is the neocortex, or we may say the key, which when touched with the vital fluid, this is this essence, this anointing, it sets free. Cast on the waters and lift it up, here we go, lift it up through the process of physical regeneration, complete with the at one with the ego whose indwelling place is the cerebellum so this is where we're dealing with the houses of consciousness in the brain continuing on and then the statement i and the father are one becomes living sun and the flaming light from sine or sinai instead of a popular epigram with no vital meaning we need to bring these scriptures to life, people. This is what this is saying. It's not just we read something, ooh, we know it. You're not. You have to live it. You have to activate it. The scriptures are not meant to just be recited. They're meant to be embodied. Please understand that. This is the crucial imperative of this, of this mission that we're given, of this kingdom that we're tasked with bringing forth. We have to bring the kingdom first and foremost within ourselves okay this is the mystery of mysteries we can talk about it whoop -de -whoop -de -whoop, but if you have not mastered yourself if you have not awakened to the level of Mashiach in you in the flesh then you have not awakened and I'm not saying just talking about it these are things that we have to work on continuously every day every day is our is our crucifixion for us we die daily this is what Shaul says I reckon myself for death daily we're counted for sheep for slaughter daily okay continuing on so again making these words come to life they're not just epigrams on a page with no vital meaning they have vital realities the dormant brain cells may be likened to a flower yet in the bird but when the substance that is required for their completion reaches them the modus operandi of the plan of salvation, the buds open or unfold and then vibrate at the rate that causes the realization of the new birth, the birth from above. And then he that is born of Elohim will not sin, but his seed remains in him. And we're going to talk about what this seed is, okay? It's very important to understand these things as well, even as it relates to the serpent, because we have a seed of the woman and we have a seed of the serpent. If you're following me and you're with me so far, please give me a seven because we are going in with this one here. All praises to the Most High. All right. Hallelujah. Just one. We got some more people. Y'all still, I know it's been a long day. And y'all got a lot of stuff on your mind and your plate already to, to process and put into, uh, into, your, into your memory banks. But you asked for it. <laughs> so we're going with it some more. Hallelujah. Okay. So as we will see in the course of this writing... Consciousness is a matter of functioning at the peak levels of our cognitive ability, or metaphysically, what is known as heaven. And I mean that in the most metaphysical of sense. And again, if you don't understand the matters of earth, how can you understand the matters of heaven? Yah has given us a heaven, earth, and even a hell, a lake of fire, within our very own makeup. If you understand what I'm saying with that, in our very constitution as humans, we have within us a heaven, an earth, and a Gehenna. Shamayim, Eretz, and Gehenna. If you understand what I'm saying, heaven, earth, and hell within us, please type in a two. Because this is very important to understand. We have to see this first within ourselves to really grasp the fullness of the understanding. Okay? Well, here's the question then. Where? Where is Gehenna? Where is hell within us? Where is our hell? Where is the hell of our of our makeup? We say we understand. We, we got to test and prove all things. No, no, no. I mean, yeah, actually, yes. On that note, yes. 
very much so in the brain as relates to that very much so but now let's think of this physically let's think of this physically there's also a corresponding system that relates to our um to to the reality of 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 gehenna now think of it in terms of system because you're now dealing with the brains below the heart what's the system below the heart what's the physical system below the physical heart what's below that exactly yo El. this is where Gehenna exists for us you ever have just stuck like acid building up in your stomach that's where all the acids are you ever get like indigestion isn't it hot and fiery feeling? Well, that's what it is. That's where the digestion begins. That's where the, the waste is consumed and then excreted. That's what Gehenna meant. Gehenna meant the lake of fire. This is where they put all the trash, all the refuse. Okay? They burned it and consumed it in Gehenna. Now, the earth. Our earth is what you said, uh, Doda. Is, is our heart and this is the physical heart this is the earth okay this is where everything is, is planted and, and comes to life from okay but it's also relative to our limbic system very much so it is related to our limbic system okay emotions the earth is responsive to how you treat it okay this is why there's so many like freak geo storms right now because of the earth is being mistreated so emotionally the earth is is acting up mm -hmm, very much so like avatar very much so the last airbender avatar even i would say that even and then the heavens is our is our head the physical head but in the the brain it is the neocortex mm, birth pains very much so aki say la say la so we have to see the correspondences that exist not only outside of us, but within us. Now, now we probably will come to that revelation last in the process, but we have to start making these connections, okay? We have to start making these connections, okay? Continuing going. At our lowest levels, we are nothing more than animals or beasts, okay? While at our peaks, we are the reflection of the image and likeness of our creator. As such, our lowest nature is typified by the display of primal instincts, self-consciousness, self-preservation, and habitual behavior, which manifests as the most base and least sublime aspect of our nature. Human consciousness or human nature is exemplified by our emotional responses combined with our ability to learn and recall memories, characterized by sapience slash intelligence, logic, reason, and speech. The state of divine consciousness, or what some call cosmic consciousness or godhood, is demonstrated by a unification within ourselves as well as with the collective states of being among sentient life forms which exudes from the supreme source of mind which is Yah of course and gives us the capacity to utilize extrasensory perceptions and the ability to bring forth most importantly self-mastery now remember I said these extrasensory perceptions we read an article earlier that says with the neocortex they are infinite abilities that it possesses. If you remember when we read that and you understand what I'm saying as relates to now the extrasensory perceptions, please give me a one. These are things that we must now not only understand, but we must live according to. Okay? The only way we're ever going to overcome the beast is if we tap into our higher being, our higher nature. We'll never overcome the beast within ourselves first if we don't come to our higher nature. We have to do that within first. That's where the victory lies, first and foremost. And we bring that together. And we got all these people who have become Mashiach themselves and have received the anointing themselves. What can stand against us when we have become set apart in Yah, truly set apart in Yah? So these three levels of consciousness are connected to the three dimensions of what is called the triune brain. They call it the triune brain. This is what science identifies the brain as, as far as the neocortex, the limbic, 
and the reptilian uh, brain functions. They call it the triune brain, okay? Three is one. And they are identified as the reptilian brain, the limbic brain, and the neocortex. These three components of our brain serve as the houses of consciousness by which we are either limited in the brain's lower functioning capacities or liberated by its higher cognitive processes. So by the way we think or by the level of, of, of activity we function on, we will either be like limited and enslaved and in bondage and oppressed and I would even say possessed by that reptilian brain or we will be liberated when we reach that neocortex level. All right, very, very, very powerful illusions that we have to see, or illustrations. We have to see these illustrations, okay? Of the three tiers of the brain, the neocortex in connection with the state of cosmic consciousness is the cognitive seat of elevation and integration. Science has even recently discovered the connection between spiritual consciousness and the evolution of the neocortex which is an exclusive physiological development to humanity. No other creature in creation has a neocortex besides human beings. There's no other creature in existence, not even uh, primates. They have no neocortex. They're in their limbic system, but they do not have a neocortex. Humans are the only creatures on earth who have been crowned, and we'll see this in Psalm, I do believe, 8, he has been crowned with the neocortex, which is what makes him like, yeah. <laughs> All praises to the Most High. As the newest component of our brains, inclusive of the prefrontal cortex, this is the sphere of activity. Quote, all thoughts coming from lower brain areas such as sight, hearing, and feeling cortex areas in the thalamus and the hypothalamus are gathered and processed to be enriched. So you gather and you process this information in order to apply it in some way in order to enrich your experience. Many information and memories gathered from different parts of the brain come together in the prefrontal areas to be synthesized into deeper thoughts. Active memory is when different pieces of information are synthesized together and form a thought active memories again is when different pieces of information are synthesized together and form a thought this means we have access to the future as well this is how the prophets saw the future they remembered something that had already taken place because in the beginning elohim created the heaven and the earth so everything was completed there and that mind was present with that if you can tap into it <laughs> if you can tap into it. And that is what this comes down to. This is about consciousness. This is beyond our limited experience of our emotions and of our basic instincts. We have to get into higher consciousness. This is what cosmic consciousness is about. This is what divine consciousness is about. This is what Torah consciousness is about. This is what Mashiach consciousness is really all about. If you agree with me and you see where this is going, Please give me another one. I got one one last time. I only got one person that agrees with me. I must be on some next levels. Excuse me if I am. But I can only share what y'all are showing and giving me. Okay? Hallelujah. Continuing on. I'm going to repeat this sentence again. Active memory is when different pieces of information are synthesized together and form a thought. And this thought is later acted upon. This allows to accurately surmise future events. This is what this allows for. You can surmise them. You can grasp and conceive and perceive what can take place. And then to plan for them, okay? This is what scripture has allowed for us to do because he's given us the vision now in this covenant. It allows for a rapid, appropriate response to the signals gathered by the five sensory channels. Of course, we know our five senses. It allows for predicting the consequences of actions before performing them and for resolving problems of a complex medical, mathematical, ethical, moral, or philosophical basis. It can also postpone emotional responses for an appropriate time, measure the consequences of verbal and physical communications, use willpower to measure the ethical and moral consequences of actions, and use information gathered from all channels 
to diagnose a problem. This is one portion of your brain and what it's just some enumerated potentials and possibilities are and capabilities. People who have damaged prefrontal cortexes have serious difficulty synthesizing information and processing it to form coherent thoughts in the active memory. This situation shows us that the prefrontal cortex enables consciousness and highly intellectual actions. This is taken from prefrontal cortex and its connection to human spirituality by an Omer Arifaguagalu. That's that last name. But in regards to the limbic system, it is often, quote, referred to as the emotional brain. The limbic system is the reactive part of us that initiates the fight or flight. It initiates it, okay? It's the reactive part. And this is the response to danger, of course. Key areas of interest to psychotherapy are the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. These form a very fast subconscious evaluation and response system designed to keep us safe. So there's a reason and a purpose for the limbic system, of course. The amygdala is like an early warning system with the model safety first. Put that safely, put that safety plan into effect before consulting the executive brain, which is the new cortex. Picture yourself jumping out of the way of a snake-like object before a closer examination reveals it to be just a hose in the grass. This is a very important first response because if it were left to the prefrontal cortex to initiate, for example, a leap out of the way of a bus you had inadvertently stepped in front of, then it might be too late. That evaluation system is too slow. It's more flexible. Amidala makes very fast, albeit not always accurate, evaluations and has a fast track from the thalamus incoming information through to the hypothalamus that can initiate a stress response to forestall impending doom. The hippocampus plays an equally important role by encoding events in time and space and consolidating them from short term to long term memory. It's amazing that, like, this stuff is even known. Like, how do you know this is where this takes place? How, how do you know? But this is what science has done over the years. And our ancestors, going back even millennia and eons, they knew this stuff. And they coded it <laughs> in sacred text. Because those, again, were the scientists. They were the scientists. They were the seers. They were the visionaries. Okay? Because what we're dealing with now, as, as quantum physics and mechanics has come about into the forefront of the world of science, they're just finding everything that was written in the words of the sages is true. It's confirming everything that our ancestors had well established. And we have forgotten. And here's my question. Why have we forgotten? What has happened to us relative to what we're discussing right now that has caused us to forget everything that we once knew ancestrally and, 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 and intuitively. What has caused us to forget? How did we do that? What did we do to turn our back on God? Keep in this is the question. The question is relative to this particular offering that's being made right here, matters of the mind. What do we do to turn back from Yah? We entered into something else. What did we enter into? We went from one thing to another. Yeah. Where did the murmuring and disobedience come from? Something had to stimulate that. What caused us to murmur? What caused us to become rebellious and disobedient? Right. We entered into our reptilian minds. We entered into our reptilian brains. Exactly, Tikva. We stopped operating at the neocortex and prefrontal area of our brain and we became sensation based. We started trusting in our sensations as opposed to our intuitions and opposed to our, our, our intelligence and opposed to our reason. And most importantly, as opposed to the word which informs all that stuff. 
The Torah informs our neocortex. It develops and perfects our neocortex. But instead, we chose to go based on sensation and emotion. And that's the Holy Spirit informs that as well, Akio El. And you're going to see that the Holy Spirit, which is the Word, let's just make that clear. The Word is the Spirit. Yahushua said, The words I speak to you, He didn't say they're flesh and life, He said they're spirit and life. So when we understand what Yah has given us is His Word, His Spirit, we walk according to the Spirit by walking according to what? The Word. So again, let's. Let's demystify this stuff. Let's take the spookism and, and, and the super mystery, mysterious nature off for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see through Hebrew vision. And I'm not talking about this room, but I'm saying through the principle of having Hebrew vision, which is basically having a Hebrew mind. Your mind informs your vision. That's what perception comes from. So again, let's go now to the lowest part of the brain where we have been brought to which we must ascend from and which we must lift up we'll get to that as the lowest part of the brain based in the stem the reptilian brain quote is the oldest and smallest region in the evolving human brain it evolved hundreds of millions of years ago and is more like the entire brain of present day reptiles serpents for this reason, it is often called the reptilian brain. Various clumps of cells in the brain stem determine the brain's general level of alertness. Listen to that. Various clumps of cells in the brain stem determine the brain's general level of alertness and regulate the vegetative processes of the body, such as breathing and heartbeat. That's what its basic purpose and function is for. It's similar to the brain possessed by the hardy reptiles that preceded mammals roughly 200 million years ago. It's pre-verbal, it doesn't talk. It's pre-verbal, but controls life functions. It controls life functions. Listen to that. This is just carnal stuff, such as autonomic brain, breathing, heart rate, and the flight or fight mechanism. Lacking language, lacking language, there's no intellectual expression that comes from this particular portion of our brain its impulses are instinctual and ritualistic listen to this autonomic yes indeed it's concerned with fundamental needs such as survival physical maintenance hoarding dominance preening and mating it is also found in lower life forms such as lizard lizards crocodiles and birds it is at the base of your skull, emerging from your spinal column. The basic ruling emotions of love, hate, fear, lust, and contentment emanate from this first stage of the brain. This is what society has been relegated to function according to. This level of brain activity. The reptilian brain. Few make it to the limbic, and even fewer make it to the neocortex. Okay, but most of the world is operating in the level of the reptilian brain. So over millions of years of evolution, layers of more sophisticated reasoning have been added upon this foundation. Reasoning, come, let us reason. The scriptures are speaking this language to us clear as day, but we've somehow made it a huge mystery. But this scripture book is one of the best if not the best scientific book ever written to man if you understand it it's speaking of biology it's speaking of chemistry it's speaking of 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 physics it's speaking of thermodynamics it's speaking of geography of, of, excuse me of, of 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 geography it speaks of all these things it speaks of of of, of apocryphary it speaks of healing and this is what this portion even is speaking of this week. It's speaking of holistic healing processes. And let's talk about it some more. Philosophy, very much so. All the subjects, mathematics, is <laughs> dealing with it all. Language, art, so on and so forth. 
So again, our intellectual capacity for complex rational thought, which has made us theoretically smarter than the rest of the animal kingdom. When we are out of control with rage, it is our reptilian brain overriding our rational brain components. If we're overcome with lust, if we're overcome with fear, if we're overcome with anything that is contrary to sound teaching, it is because the reptilian brain has overrode your neocortex and the spirit that is inserted in that particular capacity. Hmm, real talk. If someone says that they reacted with their heart instead of their head, what they really mean is that they conceded to their reptilian or their primitive emotions, the reptilian brain base, as opposed to the calculations of the rational part of the brain. There are almond-shaped groups of neurons located deep within the medial temporal lobes of the brain in complex vertebrates, including humans, shown in research to perform a primary role in the processing and memory of emotional reactions, the amygdala are considered part of the limbic system. And this is from the reptilian brain. So taking all of this information about our brains into account, when considering yet another episode of the Israelites complaining, murmuring, grumbling to Moshe in the wilderness in Parashat Huchat, a word that means statutes, we can logically deduce that this experience was a demonstration of the grumblers operating according to their reptilian brain. Somebody mentioned David Ick just a minute ago. According to David Ick, one of the foremost authorities on the reptilian agenda, a mission to enslave humanity to the impulsive, instinctual, and reactionary processes of the reptilian brain, the behaviors associated with the reptilian brain are one, obsessive compulsive behavior, two, personal day-to-day -day rituals and superstitious acts, three, slavish conformance to old ways of doing things, four, ceremonial reenactments, five, obedience to precedent as in legal, religious, cultural, and other matters, six, responding to partial representations such as colorization, strangeness, whether alive or inanimate, and lastly, all manner of deception. When you understand that the reptilian brain is responsible for operating according to the principles of deceit, then you know where that is coming from now. This is the source of this. Now, it does come from a spirit, yes, but that spirit also has a physiological response within us. And that is our reptile or serpent brain. So what was taught, what was taking place in the garden? What took place in the garden? Was it a literal serpent that deceived Hua? Or did she just tap into her reptilian brain and came down from her neocortex? Did she fall in the sense that she came from the neocortex to the rep reptilian brain? Or did she fall out of heaven? You see what I'm saying? These are the things that we have to demystify and make sense of. This is the simplicity of the scripture when we look at it. So, operating at, the, at this subconscious level of cognition was Israel's problem throughout their 40-year sojourn in the wilderness. In fact, through and through their time in the wilderness, we see the fight versus flight mechanisms aroused in them and the people falling victim to this lower brain function with out the regulation of the reptilian mind with their higher cognitive capacities. Stuck in survival mode, the people railed out again against Moshe and felt as if their death was imminent. As many of them were struck down and captured by the king of Arad, complained in utter faithlessness unto their leader. The Torah records their irrational behavior with these words, quote, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Sea of Reeds in order to go around the land of Edom. The spirit of the people became impatient going along the way. Now, here's the question. The spirit of the people, what, what are they talking about? The air of the people. You're talking about Ruach. The breath of the people. Ruach. The Ruach of the people. The spirit of the people became impatient. What does that mean? Can someone please tell me? What does that mean? When they're speaking of Ruach here, the spirit of the people became impatient. What does that mean?
Can someone please respond? Is there any thought to that? Or everybody away from their, their computer right now because we are at a super late hour. <laughs> what does it mean that the spirit of the people became impatient along the way? Is there any reflection to that? What is the spirit? Okay. Okay. How does this play out though? What is this exemplified by? What demonstrates the spirit of the people becoming impatient? Where do we see the spirit of this people emanating from? What took place? Their fear induced it, but what was the, the symptom of their fear? And what is the source? Where did it come from? Here's the question. Where did it come from? Let's look at this again. The source of their unbelief. There it goes, auntie. Back to their reptilian minds. Again, the spirit came from their mind. Their mind determined the reaction. The reaction, the, 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 the fruit came from the thought. The thought was the spirit. The thought was the spirit. It produced unbelief. It produced murmuring. It produced faithlessness. It produced fear. And that source is found again in their reptilian mind. If you agree with that particular analysis, please give me a one. If you do not, please type in a zero. Let's 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 get this clear. Let's 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 come to some consensus with this matter. Because we want to break this down so it it, it becomes really understood but most importantly we start to live more according to these principles okay so the spirit of the people became impatient along the way the people spoke against Elohim and Moses why have you brought us out from Egypt to die in the wilderness because there's no bread no water and our very spirits our minds because this where they process it at how do they know their spirit except the mind of the spirit that is within them? This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 2 speaks about. How can you know the spirit of something except the mind of the spirit that is present? No one knows this, the thoughts of a man except the, the mind of the man within him. Now, if you can tap into that all-knowing mind, then you can know that. Yahushua did that. But generally, it is the mind that recognizes the spirit. So again, they say our very spirits detest the despicable food. So Yah sent poisonous serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against Yah and you. Pray to Yah for us that he may take away the snakes. So Moshe prayed for the people. Numbers 21, 4 through 7, end quote. With this episode, we are able to see the children of Israel transition from operating right here. This specific episode, we see them operating, transition from the operating of their reptilian and limbic brain to the processes of their neocortex, more so the limbic brain. So as demonstrated by the people's reflection and acknowledgement of their mistake after they're being attacked by the fiery serpents. So while many will conjecture about who or what the fiery serpents were, some will say that they were the Levites that came and judged them for this matter. Some will say that they were the Edomites that came out and struck them down. Okay, some say that they are literally fiery serpents. So there's a lot of different interpretations of what these fiery serpents are that struck them down. Okay, those who were murmuring. Okay, did their own thoughts strike them down? Okay, because it talks about, you know, one's, con one's conscience can actually determine... Uh, uh, whether or not they're, they're, they're guilty or excused it talks about in Romans I believe chapter 2 so again while many will conjecture about who or what the fiery serpents were what is truly the focus of this portion of Torah is the exposure of the rebellious mindset of the people given this insight the appearance of the serpents in this instance is also related to the serpent found in the accounts of Genesis and Exodus as we will see, their appearance in the aforementioned scrolls of Torah, inclusive of this week's readings, are symbolic representations of the lower and higher natures that are present within us. In Genesis, we see the whispering, enchanting, deceiving Nahash or serpent, or reptilian brain at work to which Hawa and Adam succumbed and ultimately suffered a degradation of consciousness 
and vibrational energy. This resulted from their engagement of the reptilian brain, which indulged in the cynical notions of instant gratification. They saw that it was good for food, visual stimulation, and that was uh, it was pleasant to the eyes, and self-aggrandizement, in that they said, look, this is good enough to make us wise now. So they suffered from these cynical, reptilian-like desires, in turn disabling the capacities of the neocortex. The pursuit of fulfilling their selfish interests incited by the Yetzer Hara or the evil inclination induced their reptilian brain to dominate their mental faculties which flooded their senses with lust and their motor skills with the negative response to the word of the Most High. Hence, rebellion. In Exodus, however, we see the transmigration of consciousness which is a, 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 a relocation of consciousness from one place to another from the lower to higher state of consciousness through self-mastery so as symbolized by Moshe heeding the living word which caused the staff to become a serpent. In further fulfillment of the word, the staff is then transubstantiated back into a staff to serve as a witness to Pharaoh. This action symbolizes the firing of neurons to synapses and dendrites which start at the brain and travels down the nervous system to our extremities. The messages are then sent back to the brain to capture the full experience sensation-wise so that the body responds harmoniously to the situation. We also see this physiological function alluded to with the event of Jacob's ladder and Yahushua's response to the Nathaniel in regards to the angels ascending and descending on ben -Adam, or the Son of Man. Now, this is where it gets deep because what you're seeing when Moses grabs the staff and it turns into, or he, he sees the staff and then he grabs the staff and it turns into a serpent, right? Or he threw it on the ground and it turned into a serpent and then he picked it back up and it became a staff again. It's symbolic of the messages that are sent from the brain to the body. Okay, from the higher to the lower and then back from the lower up to the higher. How do we know that? To support this notion of transmigration of consciousness, we find that the Hebrew word found in Exodus chapter 4 for staff is matet, which is the Hebrew word for staff, matet, which has as its meaning a branch, split, staff, stem, or span, an expansion, or a stretching out. Okay, so this is like a development, okay? It is something that is expanding, going from a lower state to a higher state. It also carries with it the idea of ruling with a scepter and the notion of a flowing and fullness of the centers of life, thus an anointed community of members or of the faculties of man. So this is something that is anointed now. This is something that has reached its fulfillment. Okay, this is what mate means. In this sense, it can be said that Moshe was shown how to enter into a higher form of consciousness in order to go about the fulfillment of his calling. This was nothing less than Moshe arousing the levels of consciousness found in the neocortex region of the brain. So this is what this is pointing to. I'm not saying it didn't take place. I'm not saying that uh, uh, there's other meanings to it. But what I'm also saying is this is also one of the physiological realities in the layers that exist in scripture. And we're pulling out a layer of this to apply this to our life so that we can understand how to become one with Yah. And this is something that takes place within us, okay? And if you agree with that statement, please give me a two in agreement. If you don't, type in zero, okay? So we'll just continue to move forward because these are things I pray that we start to understand a little bit deeper. So with the Israelites, however, the experience in the wilderness near Edom, so as described by this week's reading, it was their fear of death coupled with faithlessness that disallowed their higher cognitive um, faculties from properly functioning. So when we understand if we're seized by fear, we're not operating in the neocortex. It completely just detaches that level of functioning from us. Anytime we get caught up in an emotion, you're detaching the neocortex. You're completely turning it off. You just shut it down. This is why it's so important to remain objective about things and not get so emotionally wrapped up into experiences because we have to remain sound at all times. Okay? Very important. So to counter this mindset, the Torah describes how Yah 
dealt with the lower functioning mentality of yet another group of rebels whose venomous thoughts, as Moray M70 said, these serpents were men, okay, uh, their venomous thoughts nearly contaminated the entire nation again. So being that they were relegated to their animal nature, which is symptomatic of being subject to the impulses of the reptilian brain, fiery serpents were sent to bite those who were so disposed. With this event, According to the Zohar's opening quote preceding this article, those who were overcome by their base impulses and, and instincts spoke in a manner indicative of their level of consciousness, which then reverberated in creation and brought about a reality which was commensurate to their degraded level of consciousness. The serpents that bit them in essence were the manifestation of their debased action stemming from their reptilian brains. There was, however, a remedy for those who so desired to not remain in such a debased state. As the narrative unfolds, we are told that a brazen fiery serpent, the word there is seraph. It is not nakash, it is seraph. So I talked about there will be a new serpent introduced into scripture. Okay? The first serpent we see of in scripture is nakash. And that is the whisperer, the enchanter, the beguiler, the deceiver. Now we have a brazen fiery serpent whose word is seraph. Okay? And this was made by which those bitten were able to be healed. Uh, boom. You already know, More AM70. You already know. That's the root. Okay? But they were healed by looking upon its image. This pole that Moshe made in the wilderness. Now, this is where it gets deep. It is representative of our spinal cord as well as the tree of life. In the Hindu tradition, this is what is called the Kundalini energy which is represented in their tradition in the form of a serpent. The encoded message of the tree of life and kundalini energy is best summed up with these words from Kim Gray Munch in the article, uh, Serpents of the Kundalini Fire. There are three forces, and we just talked about those. We talked about the reptilian, the limbic, and the neocortex, the forces of hell, the forces of earth, and the forces of heaven. But these are connected with the spine, also called Sushumna or Eharon's rod. These are Kundalini, the serpent fire, Ida the female force, and Pingala the male force. The moon moves in the Ida and the sun in the Pingala. Ida is cooling, Pingala is heating. There's balance in this matter, okay? The two serpents around the spine has two different colors like the two outer pillars in the Kabbalah tree of life. And they have the same interpretations as the feminine and masculine energies. There is a balance. There is a unity. There is a harmony. There is a unification. A oneness that is to be struck with these three forces. Okay? So, they connect earth with the spiritual world and the spiritual world with earth. That's going back again to our messages coming from the brain to the body then back from the body to the brain this is what that's about they connect the earth with the spiritual and the spiritual with the earth this is that transference of messages this is the angels going up and down jacob's ladder this is what this is about this is about the brain being in tune with Yah's word so that he can send those messages down to inform our body how to move Rebbe, remember what it says in, in i believe the proverbs the steps of the righteous man are ordered okay they are ordered and it talked about these dormant cells in the brain being like flowers so now we read this for these to flow the lotus flowers or chakras has to be open and running so we have to be able to open our chakras and they have to circulate in the proper direction which is in a clockwise direction so that our brains can function properly we got to unblock all these blockages, which is what Satan does. Satan are the dark spots that come into our life to make these voids because Yah wants us to be full of his energy. He wants us to be filled with his anointing. And anytime we have lacks, we're not blessed. If we lack something in Yah, we're not blessed. We are truly found, um, what does it say to uh, mini mini, taka ups harin, uh, you've been found, weighed in the balance and found lacking and found wanting. We cannot be found wanting and lacking. Continuing on though. For it is when our central nervous system is fully activated and functioning at optimum capacity and our chakras are circulating properly in a clockwise fashion and our neo 
cortex is informing our every conscious thought, word, and deed, then we are able to transcend both the animal and human natures, which keeps us bound to a mere terrestrial realm when in all actuality the heavens await our entry. In order to experience this elevation of consciousness from the reptilian brain and a, an awakening of the neocortex, an article entitled How to Bypass Your Reptilian Brain and Restore Your Creative Power tells us that we must learn to bypass the reptilian brain in order to thrive instead of survive. The reptilian brain is based in survival mode, which elicits impulsive program responses, constant reaction to present triggers. Characteristics of the reptilian brain include dominance, to dominate or be dominated, aggression, sex, and seeking a mate, rigidity, obsessiveness, compulsiveness, worship, fear, submission, and greed. These are all constricting and limiting frequencies. That means that you must develop the ability to bypass your reptilian brain frequencies through conscious detachment from the reptilian brain by first recognizing it for what it is. If you don't know that you're functioning in your reptilian brain, then you can't overcome it. And this is why you have to be exposed. This is why these rebels and these grumblers had to be exposed. So we can get this serpent, this seed of the serpent, out of the camp. We don't want Nahash in the camp. We'll take Saraf in the camp. I noticed that, Ima. And I, I knew that was going to come up. But surface, when you have to understand, that's, that's devotion. This is about a selflessness. This is about becoming selfless. Worship is really about... Now, keep it. This is a, a new age, not probably scriptural based uh, uh, perspective that Isabella B is writing from but when we understand Obed service or Avodah in the Hebrew we understand that as, as a selflessness as a becoming selfless and that we're, we're seeking to to have Yah increase in us by devoting and, 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 and observing Yah's ways which is really obedience right it's the same root word Obed Avodah and Obed servant in service is the same root then we understand that in a different level because I don't believe that this which she speaks of in terms of worshipping is limiting okay so let's just make that distinction so again they, she said that those different things are constricting and limiting frequencies that means that you must develop the ability to bypass your reptilian brain frequencies through conscious detachment from the reptilian brain by first again recognizing it for what it is. It is simply a shift in perception. And we talked about a while ago that that is what includes being made in Yah's image and likeness is having the ability to perceive things with divine intelligence and divine perception. That is a very important perspective that the Rambam or Moshe ben Maimon, Maimonides, provides for us in terms of perception. So we must perceive things differently, okay? Um, which will occur within your consciousness by applying detachment to any situation through delayed reaction. Don't just re react, delay it, reflect on it, then move forward, aka objectivity, which is discernment filter. You can begin to recreate your reality because you allow yourself to properly use your mind to its full manifestation power. You make life happen for you according to your desires instead of reacting to life happening to you. You take your power back, end quote. This is what Yahushua was telling us when he told his disciples, and as I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was about to die. This was John 12, 32. The death of which he speaks is that symbolized by the burial of the natural man and all of its carnal, lower nature, no, lower natural ways. This is an essential aspect of spiritual awakening in every tradition, in particular to the circumcision of the heart or mind in the Hebraic tradition, which is encoded in the idea of being born again. He also tells them that once this elevation of consciousness from the reptilian brain to the neocortex takes place, that an insight and perception of reality will take place as relates to their true identity in Yah. Quote, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know who I am. And by knowing who he is, you will know who you are. Okay. Then he goes on to say, I do nothing by myself. But speak just what the Father has taught me. That's what that reflection is for. When you get time to stop and think about it and let your spirit inform you 
and order you so that you do what you need to do. But just, uh, I do nothing by myself, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what is pleasing to him, John 8, 28. While speaking of himself in relation to the instructions that he was sharing with them, it was meant to inspire them to also arrive at the level of consciousness that he was functioning on. Um, his parabolic lessons, however, are clothed in the realm of symbols and ancestral maxims and events which holds the key to unlocking the mysteries of the kingdom within. We see this principle by which he taught epitomized when he shares these profound words with Noctibone the Pharisee. Quote, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3, 14 and 15, end quote. All of these remarks by Yahushua are relative to this week's reading and suggestive of a process that we must all undertake in order to experience the transmigration of consciousness from our animal and human nature to that of our divine nature. The essence of the fiery serpent or seraph in its symbolic state constitutes a marked difference to the serpent of old, which is Nakash, which is both antagonistic and adversarial to the new mind, which has been elevated to the region of heaven known as the neocortex. So if you understand that, this is so imperative to understand because we have to first defeat the devil, the serpent of old, that old dragon that was found in the garden within ourselves first. And that dragon, that serpent, that devil of old within us is hiding in our reptilian brain. And this is the whispers that we have to discern and overcome. That's the venom that will keep us trapped in the flesh, which will ultimately die and perish, which is why flesh and blood will not inherit this, the kingdom of heaven. We have to go to the neocortex. We have to go to the neocortex and elevate to heaven in order to have that type of thought, those type of words articulated, and that type of life lived. This is what this is talking about on one of the deeper, if not the deepest level of interpretation. So again, interestingly, the serpents mentioned in this writing are both Nakash. You will see Nakash in this as well. Hallelujah. And the deceiving and the self gratifying okay, let me go back. Interesting, the serpents mentioned in this writing are both Nakash, the deceiving and self gratifying serpent that beguiles human nature into its lower depths, and Saraf, which is the fiery serpent with wings that activate the process of consciousness transmigration through detachment from our habitual and instinctual behaviors with discernment and deliberation. When this takes place, we become elevated to the level of messengers of fire which is seraphim and if you type click on that eventually you'll go to baruch 51 and you will focus on some passages where it tells us we will become greater than the angels okay but seraphim is the plural tense of the seraph or the beings of light that we were created to be for this is the meaning of the fiery serpent on a pole uplifted in the wilderness by moshe it is the elevation of consciousness and the utilization of the latent brain known as the neocortex, which contains the hidden consciousness, which brings forth healing and life to its carrier. This is our crucifixion, our overcoming of the carnal nature of man, the conquering of animal instincts, the mastery of habitual behaviors, and control over the selfish gratifications of the flesh, which, when yielded and wielded, causes the power of creation and creator to appear within our bodies and exercise through the sentence, through the sentience, excuse me, of our higher functioning brains. Brains. This is the master of the mystery of overcoming the beast and the adversary of our souls first found within. It is then that we will be ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete and we have mastered our own natures that we will have the capability to overcome all those who are possessed by the reptilian brain, which houses the spirit of the wicked one in order to bring forth the eternal kingdom of our father and king so that justice, peace, truth, love, humility, compassion, righteousness, favor, and kindness reign forever. 
But this process is both a spiritual and a physiological matter, as Dr. Perry and Miss Carey explain with the following words, quote, we can turn to the pages of Gray's Anatomy or any good medical dictionary and examine carefully. Sleek, huh? The illustration of a 26-day-old fetus. We see then that almost the entire body consists of brain substance. In fact, it looks like an elongated brain. And we talked about a while ago that that seed is the sperm. Your brain and your spinal cord is nothing more than the fulfilled development of that sperm that impregnated that ovum or that egg. That's all your brain and your spinal cord is. It is the sperm that has developed into its fullest development. Okay, so it is the seed. So when this fetus at 26 days old is developing, it's just the brain developing and creating the rest of the body. So that's why everything comes from that head. Okay, that's where the message comes from. That's the seed. That's the word. That's everything that we, in fact, become. And that's, interestingly, exactly what Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is in relationship to the entire scripture. It's the seed. It informs everything. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It created everything. All right? Just like that seed did. So, the upper brain, or the father slash mother substance, is what furnishes the material from which the body is made. Verily, it is the alpha, the beginning. Degenerates and people living in excess have become greatly deficient in this precious material. Because this is where the anointing comes from, this material. And the whole appearance of the body testifies to the desecration of the temple. Man can become regenerated and thus save his soul, which is sown in corruption so that it may be raised incorruptible. The fluid, oil, or marrow, which flows down the spinal cord, comes from the upper brain. This is where the pineal and the pituitary secretions come from. This is what they're talking about. Matter of fact, that's where even the sperm cells come from, from your brain. And when we understand all of this stuff and we put this together, then you can see all the secrets of the kingdom of heaven revealed in just the functions of your body. So I guarantee you, if you get coded anatomy, and you get coded physiology, and you get coded chemistry and biology, and you understand your body scientifically, you will understand the Most High. You will understand the things that Yahushua understood. Because he perceived it as well. Continuing on. So again, the fluid, oil, or marrow, which flows down the spinal cord, comes from the upper brain, the creator or father, the most high, and is known in physiology as ovum, or generative seed, that life essence which creates the human form of incorruptible flesh. In the Greek from which the New Testament was translated, this marrow is called Christ, which is the Greek word for oil. When this oil is refined, transmuted, lifted up, raised, it becomes so highly vitalized that it regenerates the body and overcomes the last enemy, death. How can it be lifted up? By lifting up the Son of Man, the seed, the Word, the Savior, the oil, which is Messiah, in the spinal cord is the salt, which is mentioned in the Bible, and the Savior is the seed, or Yahushua. So again, I'll go back to what we said in the beginning in relation to what More M70 was saying. Yes, you can be in Yahushua, which is needed, but Yahushua undeniably, without question, unequivocally, must be in you. Much more imperative than you being in him. If he is not in you, no matter how much you may think you are in him, there is nothing that you will accomplish. If you're not engrafted, into the spirit of this olive tree in Yahushua. And these functions within you are not taking place. We have to do some serious work. We have to dig deeper. We have to work harder. We have to seek more. And then we have to ascend. This is what this is about. The salt and the savior both come from the same source the same place, the father, the upper brain. In the Bible allegory, the seed, which is Yahushua, is made to say, without my father, I can do nothing. 
the material from the father which forms the seed has gone through a different process from that which forms the oil. The chemical formula of the oil is Yod, Wa, He, and Nun. And Yahushua was baptized or anointed of John, not by John, as the writer says it is incorrectly quoted. But if we lift up or raise the oil in the spinal cord, this is through meditation. I would suggest to look up the microcosmic orbit. Okay, we were doing this a while ago when I was doing Tai Chi. But these are things that, that you can do to practice. Our, our ancestors did these things as well. I don't think that they would just... They had leisure time. When I mean leisure time, they had time to really reflect and engage their body, engage their mind. All of this stuff here. So if we lift up or raise the oil in the spinal cord by the power of the seed, by saving it, not by squandering it, but by saving it, it must be a physiological and chemical operation within the body of each of us. Such is the case. There is no mystery, no marvel in all the universe that is greater than man himself. Man, know thyself, confronts us down through the ages, but only a few have paid attention to the voice of the Delphic Oracle. Only a few have looked within. This is a wonderful straight and narrow way, a real straight, not straight, which extends from the upper brain, the cerebrum, to the end of the spinal cord, otherwise named Jordan, the descender. Jordan means to descend, so Jordan is symbolic of this fluid, this oil, this anointing, descending from your brain down to your body, and then back up in order to become the anointing. We find that the meaning of this Hebrew is descender or river of Elohim. The straight and narrow way is indeed the river of Elohim, for it leads to the Father, the Most High, the upper brain. This is God, man, the word made flesh, page 42 and 43. You can see a symbolism of the Etz Chaim, the tree of life, with the words Od, which is like eternity or age, or light and obed, service. Here, with all the ten sephirot, which is also symbolic of the Kadusi that you saw just above that, with the chakra system from the Hindu. Very akin systems. They're very akin Eastern systems. But I pray that what has been presented in terms of these matters of the mind has been digestible. I pray that it wasn't too heavy. I pray that it wasn't. And I know I came last, so I know the attention span for us being on here for the past, wow, almost, what, nine hours? Nine hours. We've been on here for nine hours. Has not oversaturated you. Um, but these are matters that we have to truly grasp and understand. Everything that has been presented here from Moray M70, uh, Aki Yerm, Moray Nuriyahu, Moray Shabaniah, and I pray myself as well, has, has, has been inspired to be given to you. It's, it's something that we, I know for myself, I strive to remove myself from the equation when, um, presenting this offering to you all because I want to be objective myself. Uh, this one was a very exciting offering though to make because it helped me. It, it, it truly gave me a diagnosis that I can really look at myself in a more clear sense and see how I'm operating in a psychotherapeutic sense. And, 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 and I know for myself, I, I try to take the heed the words of Yahushua about removing the plank from your eye so you can take out the splinter in your brother or your sister's eye because, you know, I'm not there yet. I want to be there, but I'm not completely there yet, and it's a process. And I believe that, you know, presenting this information helps me to stay that much more on task, you know. But even in the midst of that, there's still moments when we operate according to our reptilian brain. I'll say that personally. There's still moments when I operate according to my reptilian brain and I don't want to be there. So I, I want to beseech and petition each and every you, one of you all to keep me in prayer for the mastery, for the overcoming, for the victory, and for the, the, the elevation, and for the lifting up of the Son of Man. Because... You know, this is a serious matter. And more importantly, pray that we all are found together in that place that Yah has called for our salvation. So that we can then bring this light together and, and make this, um, this world truly Yah's 
domain in his kingdom. So with that, if there's been anything that has been spoken that has been edifying or has been uh, truth, uh, has been in the spirit of truth and has uh, been insightful to you and has given you all maybe a new perspective on some things, please give all praises and esteem to Abba Yah for where this information comes. I didn't really know what direction this was going to go when I started. I was looking at Anna Venom, but this is where it led me. And I'm thankful and I praise Yah for this here because this has been a huge breakthrough for me personally. This is a major piece of the puzzle personally for me. So I pray that it has served somewhat of a similar um, uh, role, played a similar role for you all as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and relinquish the mic. Um, and uh, If there's any comments or questions or reflections that may be present, uh, please do come to the mic. I'll close with a hot seat Kaddish and then I will relinquish the mic. So with that, in the spirit of prayer, hallelujah. Yit Kedal Vayit Kedesh Shemei Rabah V'yamadi Vara Kerutei V'yamelech Malkutei V'chayichun Uv'yamichun Uv'chayei D'kol Beit Israel Bagala Uv'izman Kari V'imiru Amen Yehe Shemei Rabba Mavorach V'yolam Bulmei Amaya Yit Barak V'yishtabach V'yipa'a V'yit Roman V'yit Naseh V'yit Hadar V'yit Alei V'yit Halal Shemei D'kudesha Berechu V'yela Min Kol Barachata V'ashirata Tush Bechata V'nechmata and Toda Rabbah for choosing to fellowship with us here today in Hebrew Vision and for tarrying with us for this nine, almost ten hour trek of, of spiritual journeys into the Parshat of Huchat. You are truly appreciated, you're loved. Um, even though we may not know you face to face, in the spirit, you know, there is a connection that we have established in this room. And when we do get to meet each other, like I met Zakhan Yona last year for the first time, it's like we've known each other for so long. So, I mean, that moment when we do unite and we see each other face to face is truly going to be a celebratory event. And I look forward to that on that day. But other than that, I'm going to go ahead and relinquish this mic. If there are any thoughts, comments, reflections, questions from any of the offerings that you've heard today, please don't be shy. Come up to the microphone, share. I know it's 11.30 pretty much in the Holy Land right now. Shabbat Tov to you. Shabbat Shalom to you all in the diaspora. And may your Shabbat continue to be fruitful and restorative. One love in Mashiach Yahushua's name. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Tov. I'll relinquish the mic.